Are you ready for the conscience of psychiatry? For the best-selling author of Talking Back to Prozac, Medication Madness, and now Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, it's the Dr. Peter Bregan Hour with guests unafraid to speak the truth about psychiatry and psychology and about how you can make the most of your own life. And this is Dr. Peter Bregan. Welcome, my wonderful, wonderful audience, cutting-edge people in our field from around the world. Um, and don't forget my book, Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety, because I've put so much thought and time into alternatives that help us and uh, in our personal lives, but also as therapists or as clients in therapy. So don't forget to just check out Guilt, Shame, and Anxiety on Bregan.com. My guest today, Lyle Murphy, I hear you clearing your throat. You're there? Yeah, I didn't know I was actually live. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> I thought I'd let you, thought I'd cue you in. Um, you are live. And Lyle is a very interesting man, a brave man, with a program that is unique, as far as I know, in the world. If anybody knows different Goodness gracious, uh, get in touch with me, um, you know, at, at the office, uh, which is in the phone book in Ithaca. Uh, but I don't know of anything else. Been been looking around. Uh, other people have talked a lot about doing what we're going to talk about today, but nobody's done it. And yet it may be what we're going to talk about today, the single most important thing that mental health professionals and allied people and advocates need to be doing. So let me say that again, the single most important thing. Uh, Lyle Murphy, uh, I haven't visited his center that we'll be talking about, so I'm learning with you about the center and from my recent conversations with him, and we're going to be learning more as the hour goes on. I'm, Lyle is the founder of Alternative to Medicine to Meds Center. You can just Google that, Alternative to Meds Center. Uh, like a lot of innovative people, he started out as a chiropractor. He also got a postdoctorate certificate in environmental medicine. He himself had what he calls, quote, a manic episode which was actually caused by hypoglycemia. And he um, got a shot of an antipsychotic drug. He may tell you more about that. And it d did not help him. He did, however, recover once he came across the detoxification and supplementation techniques used by the Alternative to Med Center. And as we get into this conversation, many of you who know me well will know that I'm pretty skeptical about detoxification and supplemental techniques, but I'm going to listen, and I want you to listen too. And from my view, more importantly, Lyle Murphy is doing a lot more in terms of a therapeutic milieu and offering a variety of therapeutic approaches than... Uh, than the, the ones oriented around biochemistry. And by the way, that most people I know, actually everybody I know, which is like two or three people or groups who's, who try to withdraw people from drugs, none of them do it with a kind of comprehensive approach that emphasizes psychiatric problems. The ones I know, and they mostly deal with opiates and alcohol, they, they too offer... Um, various detoxification and supplemental techniques. So Lyle Murphy is not alone in that. Um, Lyle now has a professional staff of over 55 persons, and that includes uh, a medical docs, clinical psychologists. Um, the alternative to meds is a state-licensed residential mental health and addiction treatment center. I don't know of anything state licensed in that manner that focuses so much on the mental health and psychiatry issues rather than just a 
uh, pain meds and alcohol, the typical addiction withdrawal programs. Um, according to Lyle, um, he um, is one of the foremost experts in medication withdrawal techniques. I, I don't think there's any question about that. And uh, he's successfully withdrawn over 1,300 people of all types off psychiatric meds in a residential uh, setting. Lyle, I'm really glad you're on the show. Um, I just want to give you the mic to talk for a while. Well, thanks, Doc. And, you know, honestly, there wouldn't be people like me here doing this if it wasn't for people like you blazing the trail for us to follow. So I definitely want to give you um, the, the accolades for that. I mean, it was 10 years ago when I was coming out of my own mental health issues. I mean, it, it was more than just, you know, a hypoglycemic event. I mean, I went into a coma, and I was out for two weeks. And when I came out of it, I mean, literally, I had the IQ of a, a four. I mean, I couldn't walk, I couldn't talk, I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't remember anything. Well, I'm a little, me, well, let me interrupt a sec. I'm a little confused. Did you have what you would call a psychotic episode and that was a part of this, or did this coma occur after you got drug treatment? No, this was when I was finishing up chiropractic school, and I was, I mean, I literally was a starving student. I put all of my money into my tuition. Oh, dear. And I didn't <laughs> save much to, for my sustenance. And I went about three days without eating. And, you know, I had been getting a little more and more lofty. <clears throat> and since I was, you know, the top of my pre-med class, and I was, you know, really high achieving over chiropractic school, people just thought maybe I was more eccentric. And what was really going on is, you know, I thought I was getting, like, to, like, like I was the focal point for the, uh, spiritual unfolding in the planet and you know I really I was I was running so hot I wasn't taking care of myself I wasn't eating like I should you know things like that and um, by the time I, I, I went into a full-blown psychosis I mean I was seeing a whole reality that wasn't there I was seeing things that were not <clears throat> there and I hadn't been doing any drugs and I had enough of my um, you know I had enough uh, reasoning ability to, to, to kind of look at this and go, wow, okay, what is happening to me? And I got picked up by the police, and they took me off to jail. And um, I had asked them for a blood sugar test because the only thing I could figure was that I must be going looped out because my blood sugar is slow. And they, uh, they found that my blood sugar was 39. And they did not give me any food, anything. They just put me in a cell. And then the next thing I know, I woke up in a hospital it was two weeks later, and my mind was completely erased. Oh, and that, yeah, that's an incredible story, Lyle. It's just incredible. You know, one of the things that I hadn't realized we'd be talking about is, folks, you really can go through severe emotional breakdowns for one reason or another, and come out in the long run. I think a better, stronger, more effective human being, and. And, Lyle, I didn't know this about you. I didn't quite get it when we first talked. I mean, you're just a remarkable inspiration in that regard. Thank you. And I, and I feel, you know, there was the, – the, the whole story of my psychosis is really, really super fascinating. And we don't have time to go in it. But at it, it, one point along the journey, there was like this person that came to me that would <clears throat> not say a word if I try to engage in conversation, would just abruptly say, I don't know what you're talking about, but then proceeded to show me things <clears throat> in a nonverbal way. And one of the things he did, he took a newspaper and he folded the headline over and he turned it around and he showed it to me. And it said, out of disaster comes a miracle. And it was in Miami Herald and it was right after the homestead thing when the, when the hurricane wiped the place out. And that was right before I went into the coma. And that's what's actually happened here. I mean, I went so far down on the hero's journey. I mean, I was sleeping 20 hours a day when I first came out of this. I, in, the, in the four hours a day I was awake, I wasn't really awake. I was not functioning. And that lasted for 10 years. 
I mean, it was a long, 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 long trek. And when I got my brain back and I realized that, wow, there are so many other people that are, have been put in this situation, so many people that have shown up at a hospital or been put in jail or whatever that have been misread as to what's going on with them and dumped a bunch of medications and called a diagnosis and told that they're broken and that's, you know, they're going to have to take these meds for life, that I decided I needed to do something about that and I had my brain back in order to be able to do it. So I started in trying to figure out, okay, how Let are we going to help these Again, folks? just for clarification, <clears throat> were you medication-free at that point? When did you get med-free when you actually began to realize you could do something for yourself? I was off and on meds for 10 years. But I wasn't so you were on and off at that point, okay? Not at the end point. I mean, it, the, the medication uh, inductions for me were, were, you know, in that 10 years after that event, I would have um, crises, and I would show up in the hospital, and they would, you know, tie me down and inject me with whatever. And um, then I was supposed to continue doing meds. I think my longest time on meds is a little over a year. And it was a combination of... Uh, Abilify and Wellbutrin, and I and I wasn't that. It, it didn't help me, so I wasn't that faithful to taking it. I mean, I was, you know, I wasn't feeling a whole lot of reward in life, and yeah. the medications, especially Abilify, is not going to up my reward. It just made me feel more like crap. Well, it was probably contributing to that sense you had of being partially comatose for ten years. Well, you know, I was partially comatose with or without meds. The, the, at, at that point, I don't, <clears throat> I don't know what was keeping me in that place. I mean, I think that what had actually happened, that in the coma, I had suffered um, a stroke. I mean, my balance was off. I, 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 I couldn't articulate. Like, I would talk. I, would, I mean, I, it was like that. So I think it was just, uh, I think there was some brain damage there. <clears throat> Well, go ahead with this story. This is really, really interesting and, and new to me, and I think it's so important. And don't worry about time. I mean, if we ended up spending the whole time on this, we could have you back to talk about your group. Uh, um, but um, just see how it goes for the next few minutes. So you, you carried us in the story up to the point where you're on and off meds and probably more off than on, and you begin to uh, recover. You begin to get new ideas. Well, I did a cleansing program that was associated with a uh, drug rehab that I was volunteering at. And, um, you know, they had this sauna process that was very basic. It wasn't anywhere near what we're doing, but it involved B vitamins and niacin and vitamin C and stuff. And it really popped me out of it. I mean, I spent 30 days doing that process, and it wasn't easy. About four days afterwards, I'm, I'm walking up these stairs, and I feel like I'm two stairs below my body. Like, I mean, I'm not seeing my body in front of me, but I'm just feeling like my body's already ahead of the stairs, and I'm behind it. And so I took a moment to step up the stairs to be in my body. And in that moment, I felt like the power had just gotten turned on. And, you know, one day into it, two days into it, three days into it, I'm fearing that this feeling is going to go away, that this level of clarity is going to just go off into the ethos, and I'm going to go right back into <clears throat> not being able to find passion. Or, I mean, I couldn't even tell a story and have it make sense because I would forget what I was talking about in the middle of the story because my short-term memory was gone. And after six months of still feeling that way, I said, okay, I think I can help people that had these kind of problems in a different way. And that's when I went off to go get my uh, the postdoctorate certificate um, in uh, environmental medicine with a fellow named Walter Crinion, who is a uh, very well-known naturopath taught at the, uh, the uh, naturopathic college in Arizona. And I, and I found out how people are getting poisoned by their environment and the neuropsychiatric effects that those are having on people. And all of those folks that, you know, I was learning from, like, you know, David Quigg, uh, who's the uh, legal uh, scientific genius behind Doctor's Data, 
um, Bill Ray, who runs a uh, environmental medicine place out in Texas that's uh, been in practice probably as long as you have. <clears throat> but none of these folks that were doing these amazing things really were focusing on mental health. And since the brain is this biochemical organ that is very um, vulnerable to chemical changes, I was finding that the way that we were cleaning up the chemistry was profoundly affecting people's mental health. Like the, 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 the I know you've seen the patients that come in and they're, their psychology is just a loop. I mean, they're almost like they're worse than a kid that just keeps asking you the same question over and over again. They just go around and around and around in circles. And you try to get them to go in a straight line, and they just keep going around and around in circles. They just keep perseverating or ruminating on whatever, whatever that thing is. Once we brought that biophysical approach in and started cleaning up their mercury or the, um, the pesticides or organophosphates, whatever the things were that they were plugged up in, like suddenly they could take that, psychotherapeutic approach and do something with it. They could actually move forward in their process. Now, some of these things you're identifying are difficult to test for, if not impossible. So is there a lot of hit and miss in the way you go about it? I would think that almost has to be. You know, I've, I've become seasoned enough to realize that lab testing is, um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing concrete about a lab test just because you get something back on someone's DNA and you say, well, you know, you've got these genetic polymorphisms here or there or, <clears throat> you know, your ability to clear out, um, you know, cigarette smoke, poly, poly aromatic hydrocarbons, or your ability to methylate or whatever. You know, some people, their DNA is a complete train wreck, and they're functioning all day. And some people, things look reasonably good, and they're, they're a mess. But what we do in order to test for, um, like, a toxicity load <clears throat> is we have a, uh, you've probably heard of a chelation challenge. We warm people up for a chelation challenge for the first three to four weeks. We found that if we tested people on day one, a lot of times you would get a false negative. You wouldn't see what's there because they didn't have enough minerals or glutathione and other things that are actually needed to open up detoxification pathways to even see a dump. So we would, we would, pre, <clears throat> we would preload their system enough and check for what kind of dump we get. And... Um, so they get an infusion of, of a chelator, and then we collect their urine over the course of 24 hours, and we send it in. And that gives us some idea of when you balance uh, Lyle, that up against what... Lyle, mm -hmm. describe to mm -hmm. people what a chelator is. A chelator is a protein that will bind a metal or a mineral and pull it out of the body. So what chelator means, it means claw-like. It's a molecule that basically claws onto a heavy metal. So you can, you can shake the body burden a little bit and see what's in there. It's kind of like if you have a, you have a beehive. You know, you kind of maybe see a little bee flying in and out. But if you go up and whack the beehive, you're going to get an idea how many bees are in the beehive. You don't, you, you're not going to be able to count them all, but you do see all these bees fly out. And if you don't see bees fly out, then you know it's kind of a, there's not a lot of bees in there. So that's what the chelator is like. You, you provoke the body to dump stuff, and then you see how much is it dumping. And that gives you an idea of what the person might be plugged up with. And this is a technique that's been used in very traditional settings during poisonings of, of a few kinds, hasn't it? Oh, Yeah. Well, it originally started with um, trying to help people um, that had uh, arterial placking to break the, 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 the calcium plaques off of, uh, off of yeah. um, so internal So go ahead, vessels. Ben. Tell us, tell us some more about this. So you, you give people the chelating agents and you give them other things to support nutrition. And then what happens? <clears throat> well, I want to go back a little step. And because I, I was thinking about this, I'm like, okay, how am I going to give, you know, Peter hasn't been here, but 
on graduation on Friday, we run a graduation where we give people a acknowledgement and honor them for, you know, the, the process they went through. And I'm sitting at graduation, I'm like, now how do I how do I convey this to Peter, what's happening right here, in a way that he can feel it, it transmits to him um, the vibe that the center has. And I look around and I and I and I see this one girl and she's like leading a um, Zumba dance to an 80s song. <clears throat> and I mean, this girl's got the incredible moves. She's been there for maybe 10 days. A week before she came in, she tried to hang herself because she was left alone in a hotel room. Her family kind of pushed her away. And her whole, the beauty of her spirit is really around connection and being with her community and her church, and she just felt ostracized. Then I look at the girl next to her, and I go, it, it, who's smiling and laughing and, like, opened up completely. This girl had, was, was so agoraphobic that she couldn't leave her house. She didn't leave her house for two months before coming into the center. And she saw a post from this, uh, this interview, that we were doing this interview, and she's like, that's the place I need to be. And she steps in and sees how well everybody else is doing. And, yeah, she's still got a lot of OCD around using the bathroom and, you know, germs and <clears throat> all kinds of stuff. But she can feel the vibe of people getting better, and she knows she's going to get better. So when she says, I'm going to dedicate my life to this, I believe her. I believe that she's actually going to do that. And then I look at the next guy, the guy that we're graduating. This is a guy that went to the Cleveland Pain Clinic, a millionaire. And he spent tons of money trying to figure out the, how to get through his pain. He had blown discs in his back, couldn't sleep, so they put him on Ambien. He, he came in on 30 milligrams of Ambien, came into the center, and he left the center, and he went to another center for a day, and he came back, and then he drove up to Sedona, and then he drove back to Phoenix. I mean, the guy was all a mess all over the place. <clears throat> we landed this guy, and this is a top-notch CEO, and the, the beauty of his statement like, I have been to the best pain clinics in the country, if not the world. And none of that works for me. And this did. And then you multiply that times the 18 people. That's the vibe that people are stepping into. So what I think is really, really, really getting people is that they're coming in with the broken parts of themselves with enough hope. And then they get there and they see how successful other people are that look, just, that look just like them when they came in. And there's a supportive environment that kind of creates its own vortex that people can feel the hope in their life. That's a starting point. And then you clean up their physiology. Then you do this, the um, psychic dialogues with people to pull apart, like, you know, what's really going on, you know, where... Where is your desire maligned by your fear? You know, all those sorts of things. And start to put that together into a unified mission statement for that person. And you support it with the other people and you support it by cleaning up their physiology. That's why people are getting better. And the, <clears throat> anyone can do this. Anyone can create a center where you can get insurance and you can get licensing to cover this type of of loving environment because the licensing agencies honestly they don't care whether you're putting people on drugs or you're getting them off of drugs they care that you've got a licensed medical director that's doing it and you've got a clinical psychologist that is you know screening your folks to make sure that they're going to be okay there and and that's what it takes to do it and you still get paid you know sometimes we get stiffed by the insurance companies because they think that they should have been on meds, but for the most part, we get paid just like any of the allopathic places to do something that actually works. And now at this point, we've put together metrics we're getting ready to publish <clears throat> about the success rates, and they completely blow away. Nobody else even in the treatment industry really even has measurable metrics because they don't, they don't get the success. It's, it's kind of a joke in the treatment industry, like what the, what the success is with people, because it's not. It's a, it's, a, it's a revolving door where people come in, they get spin dried, and then they go back out. And they go back into their same environment, and they white knuckle it until they fall on their face. 
I think I certainly think that's to a great extent what we know. It would be so important for you to do a a very standard research evaluation of of the results. If the more you can make it look like like any other good solid research evaluation of outcomes, uh, the better. Um, are you working in that direction? Do you have somebody like that? Well, <clears throat> we've gathered the data. I still need to get the statistician together to write up the thing right. Um, now, looking back, I wish I'd have done something like an MMPI or something that was more standard. But what we did is we checked uh, people's subjective symptoms on 20 different parameters. Their pain, their anxiety, their depression, their anger, their hearing voices, their drug cravings, their suicidal ideation, and for the whole time they're here on a scale of 1 to 10. So how we got the metrics was we compared the first week. We averaged out what, what sort of symptoms they had in their first week against the symptoms that they had in their last week. And mind you, we're getting people off of medications during this process. So to even, to even see their symptoms stay the same and not escalate would be pretty impressive. But to see it actually go the other direction and see, you know, on the average a 40 to 50 percent decrease in their symptoms, that's pretty remarkable, especially for such, you know, for such a short-term, physiologically what feels, you know, the way that the neural adaptation needs in order to really stabilize, to take people through this in an eight-week process is, um, is, is pretty, it, it, it's, it's it's pretty hopeful. It's pretty, um, you know, exciting to see that 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 you know you've actually got numbers to show that people are getting better. Yeah. Well, from all of your enthusiasm and all the multiple ways you give hope, and the fact that you actually take the people off the meds, I could imagine that you are being successful. Um, I think a long way myself from knowing what elements. Um, are doing it, but uh, you're not. You're apparently not doing anything that's harmful to the people while you're trying a whole variety of things. It would. There's no way you can do a controlled clinical trial that I could figure out, but it would be awfully good for the world and your own uh, expansion of your program, and maybe programs everywhere, and maybe programs of funding. If you could begin to sit down with uh, people who do research, at least one or two good people, and plan in a year or so, you'd have to plan ahead to actually start to do an evaluation on on a number of different um, parameters with a number of, of validated kinds of tests to to really be able to write a paper that says, look, this is all the things we did in the beginning, these are all the things we did in the middle, these are all the things we did in the end, and then we have a six-month follow-up, and to be able to put all that together, I think what you're going to what you're gonna produce is going to be useful, but planning ahead a ways to do something that would meet the standards of getting it published in a journal um, would just hugely, uh, I think, influence the direction of things. And that's what <clears throat> we had a we had some hedge fund folks come in here, and they had um, they had done their diligence on finding the most successful treatment centers in the country, because they were um, you know they're they're buying up there's there's actually kind of a there's actually kind of an asset grab going on in the uh, drug treatment industry, <clears throat> and what what a lot of folks are trying to do is trying to get enough of these beds together where they can get in network with insurance, go public with it, and sell it. So they ended up on my doorstep. I mean, the amount of money these guys had is ungodly. I mean, billions of dollars. And they said, okay, we've gone all over the place, and we know that you're getting results in places that people aren't. So this is exactly what we want you to do in order to step up to this because we need to add a wellness component to all these other places so that we can show the insurance companies 
unequivocally that we have measurable statistics that we've got uh, what's that term called when they evidence based evidence based that's what I'm looking for you have evidence based um, therapies and so that that is the track we're going down now and we are that's planning really to go important. big with I'm that. so glad good is, are these people going to fund it fund the um, uh, setting it up the uh, study you know I I'm doing that part myself and um, they're off buying a lot of different properties right now. They bought some places up in Poconos, uh, New York. They bought a 450-bed uh, Crown Plaza in Somerset, New Jersey. They've bought a few places in uh, near the Seattle area in Georgia. The idea is to is to kind of nail down the four quadrants of the United States, and then seek to open in other areas like Chicago or Texas and. And that is this mostly for alcohol and uh, opiates that they're doing it? Because I can't imagine anybody so far-sighted as to be risking that kind of money on the uh, <laughs> detox. Well, actually, they are pretty forward-thinking. Um, one of the fellows involved. Uh, he runs rehabs in Florida. Florida is kind of the hotbed for um, rehabs. And, you know, they were just looking around and going, uh, it, knowing that everyone else is getting about a 3% success rate. And um, <clears throat> so it is going to be tailored somewhat towards drug addiction and towards alcohol, but it's all the other things that go along with that. I mean, there's m most people that are into drugs are, are, have a dual issue. They're on medications as well. Oh, and absolutely. what's happening in the treatment yes. industry, as you know, is that, <clears throat> and it's absolutely, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's dis disgusting to me, and I'm sure it's disgusting to you, but here come, here come these drug addicts and alcoholics that go into a treatment facility and get taken off whatever drugs that they liked or whatever they were on, and then they're put on these pharmaceutical medications instead. And then they call that treatment, and then they build the insurance companies for it, and they get paid, a, a, you know, the kind of money that you would get paid if you were actually doing something for somebody. And that's what they call addiction treatment now. They want to move away from that. We want to move away from that. Tell us more about um, the, the psychosocial aspects of what you're doing. I know you're doing a bunch of different things. You're creating a milieu. You're doing different kinds of therapies, some of which we talked about um, before the show a couple of days ago. Um, give folks a sense of what the what kinds of psychosocial educational things are made available. Totally. And I'll give you a little background on this. So <clears throat> when um you know, in the last few years when we really started getting more into the psychodynamic and the, and the you know, the psychological interventions, um, it, it kind of was the standard that we didn't go digging for things because people that are in medication withdrawal are not psychologically fit enough to figure out their floundering marriage or, you know, um, big moves in their life or how they've been traumatized by, you know, um, a family member or something like that, that, that really, when they're in the heat of withdrawal, you know, you just kind of, you just kind of be delicate around that. And what was happening in the psychotherapy was largely happening behind closed doors. And what happened in psychotherapy kind of stayed in psychotherapy. And that approach wasn't working as well as we wanted. And so we shifted things up a little bit where when we, when we do an excavation with someone, it involves more than just the therapist. It involves the care managers. It'll involve me. It'll involve um, other senior members of the center. And we'll go through, and, and what I've seen to be um, 
reasonably predictable in people's psychology is that, you know, we all have these desires in life that we want to fulfill, but there's obviously a reason why we're not doing it. Or if, if, if we're not doing it, there's a reason why. And usually it's because it's eclipsed by some fears, you know, like, hey, I want to do this thing that you know, is travel or I want to, you know, um, have a more spontaneous life or I want to have uh, a degree of freedom. But, you know, I might lose my stability and I might be a failure and, I, and, and, and people may not like me if I speak my mind and all of that. So we get in there and we do an exploration, an excavation on what those fears and what those desires are. And the person just writes them out. You know, what are your, what are your top 20 desires? You know, and what are, your, what, you know, what are three of your fears? And we look at that and we look for themes. And we do this in more of a group setting where when we start to go through all the different things that they've written down, you can see themes start to develop. Like, for instance, you know, a, a middle-aged woman that her kids are in their late 20s, she's in her early 50s, her life has been really about the, essentially a codependent relationship where her identity has been about creating an identity for her kids and creating an identity for her husband, and that's been her identity. She's been in the role of mom. And now she's in her 50s. Kids are grown. She's got anxiety. She's got depression. She doesn't know anything about, I mean, she gave up any, any, um, any hopes of having an education and going off to school and having a purpose in life because she's been dedicated to other people's purpose. And now she's in a place where she wants to do that, but her whole identity has been wrapped up in this predictable, secure thing. And then there's that inner critic running around in there that's, that's, that's telling you, well, oh, you know, you don't have an education, you can't do this. So the fears are basically running the show. So we get a person to list out all that stuff. So we've got enough to work with. We break it down into, into the themes. Like, okay, you've got this part of your psyche in there that's this inner rebel that wants to just get in the car, take off, don't worry about if the dogs are fed, leave your husband, don't worry about your, if your kids are going to give you grandkids, and just run off to Sedona and start working in energy medicine. And then there's the other part that's like, Oh, my God, if I do that, I'm going to lose the love of my family. I'm going to lose the security. I'm going to, you know, I, I don't know how to do it. I don't know if I'll survive. My symptoms are so bad. Maybe, you know, maybe I'll end up in a psych ward. And the, all of that power, all, basically those are crossed wires. You know, the person's desire wants to go in one direction. The fears are pulling them in another direction. So we will we'll form a game or a process of some sort where – a person either sits in one, you know, they, they take on the identity of the freedom rebel in one chair and they say everything that the freedom person wants to say and then they go and sit in the other chair as the predictability and control person and hearing that person, hearing that freedom person's desires, you know, what does this security person have to say? And so they kind of go back and forth with that. Sometimes we'll have other staff members sit in and be that person. Sometimes there'll be a committee of four different people that represent four different aspects of their personality. But anyway, they get all this stuff kind of out there. And then if, if the strong voice is the inner critic or if the strong voice is in the I got to be a good girl or whatever that is, we figure out a way to, to take that power and to direct it back into a mission statement that serves the person's purpose and serves the person what they attach their desires to be. And then the process that we set up for that is powerful enough to where, you know, people really feel like, you know, they, they, <laughs> they, um, it's a memorable experience to them, to say the least. And then we just keep reinforcing that. You know, we might sit down and take on the identity of their mission statement and just say, what have you done for me? Like a little kid, like just sitting there on the edge of the seat going, okay, what have you done for me? I'm your mission statement. And they say, hey, you know, I called my family and I said that I don't even know what my purpose is, but I want to dedicate myself to it, and I, I want your support around that. And thank you. And so they just keep reinforcing that. And 
try to re- like whatever whatever receptor sites in their brain that were that were hijacked by this inner critic that they start replacing that with actual kisses, if you will, to their own on a cellular level because they're actually doing things and their own desire is thanking them and saying, thank you, thank you for making these steps. And that inner wise person inside them that knows acknowledges them for making those steps. That's part of it. Very interesting, and and it sounds like it would be an effective approach to helping people. I like the sound of it. We're talking with folks. I've been so involved in this conversation that I haven't even reintroduced who we're talking with. We're talking with Lyle Murphy. He runs a licensed residential holistic mental health and addiction treatment center. And uh, the center is called Alternative to Meds. Um, he's been doing this for quite some time. Uh, when the medalists come out, ten years, okay. And uh, it is one of a kind. We need exactly what Lyle is doing in a variety of approaches. Um, as you all know, I'm more skeptical on the biochemical end, but I'd love to see a lot of places doing what Lyle is doing and to see places that are doing even more, perhaps, of the psychosocial, although I think, Lyle, you're obviously creating such a positive environment, just a hopeful positive environment, which is the essence of psychosocial help. Um, I just think what you're doing is really important. Lyle Murphy, you can find him uh, really easy by his name or by alternative to meds, uh, Googling it. Any other ways, uh, uh, Lyle, that people should get in touch with you? Well, pretty much if anybody types in a drug name like Prozac or Zoloft or Paxil and puts the uh, suffix alternative at the end of it, in the organic Google search, we're going to show up number one or number two, and we've gotten that far. Um, some of the educational things for the people at home that you know can't get to the center for whatever reason, be it financial or just logistically, um, we have gone through great pains to create animated videos using uh, illustrators and animators to try to get uh, you know, because just talking about some of this stuff can be a bit of a talking head in, in word salad. So getting it to where people can see it and visualize it and they can start to understand the science and, and everything. Uh, we have some YouTube videos. If you go to Alternative to Med Center YouTube and look through some of those videos, some of them are very well, um, uh, very well done. There's one that's coming out soon within the next week. Uh, maybe give me 10 days to finish it up. i got to edit it. But it took me six months to put this last one together, and it really talks about medication withdrawal and what is happening on the level of the neurochemistry and how that neuroadaptation, uh, what happened in response to the medications and what's going to happen in response to coming off the medication and just what to prepare for and what kind of symptoms to expect, and really just granularly what's going on there. And then there's also an ebook on the website that is really a transcript from the third, uh, the third animated video I'm doing. So it's called Medication and Withdrawal. Good. So you're trying to reach out and offer people stuff that's uh, available for free that can help them. You really are on a mission, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Do you want to talk some about that, what it's been like to, um, to do something no one else has done? What, is, what has that been like for you? Well, you got some big shoes to fill, brother. It might take three or four or 12 of us to do it. But <clears throat> as far as my part, you know, I had a really meager um, start to all this. I took over, you know, uh, uh, a couple hotel rooms in San Francisco and was having people 
uh, tell them to stay there while I would take them to a doctor that was willing to help them reduce their medications. And for the first year, I was literally paying myself. I mean, I was working over 40 hours, but I was paying myself for, for 40 hours at $5 an hour. And in the second year, I got myself up to uh, $7.50 an hour and um, didn't get much beyond that for the first five years. And the, you know, the problems I faced in the beginning, a lot of it was financial. You know, it costs a lot more to deliver a 24-7 program to someone than, you know, than, than I expected. And a lot of my early uh, sufferings were really around zoning and planning because I didn't realize, and this is an important thing for anyone that has any designs or intentions of opening up a center like this, I got deluded into thinking that you need a special conditional use permit in order to operate a residential treatment center in a neighborhood. So that would, you know, you would normally think that you'd have to get forced into some kind of commercial operation. And that's, that's pretty adventurous for someone that's just starting out. And you don't. I mean, there, there are federal fair housing protections for these folks because they're considered disabled. And by virtue of the fact that they're considered disabled, they um, can live as a single family unit. So we got chased out of, um, not chased out of San Francisco, but we got, I, I tried to change for, tried to um, apply for a zoning change when there wasn't any issue, but you know, we put this big billboard out, out on the street and, and a place that we'd been at for a year and a half without any, uh, the neighbors didn't even know we were there suddenly, you know, there was a lot more interest in what we were doing. And um, the planning department had a couple people that were concerned, wanted to know more about it. So I, I had an open house and, you know, invited people from the community to come by. And most people were just completely like, oh, my God, this is fantastic. But there was like this little enclave of, of, of a few, like three or four people that, you know, saw it as a threat to their neighborhood, and they didn't want to have a rehab in their neighborhood. And um, the planning commission denied our um, conditional use permit. And then, uh, and this was before we were licensed. And so then the state came in and said, "Well, you need a license for this and that." And and we weren't even advertising that we were doing drug treatment or doing anything outside of holistic care. So I went to a lawyer, and you know, one of these guys that's down at one Bush Street, you know, at their office way up on top of the building and and he said, Well, it sounds like you're sounds like you're um you're this is it, you're screwed. And I said, Well, <laughs> you know, this is my life's work. And if if it's gonna come to a close right now over this thing, I want you to read these fair, federal fair housing um uh um things and, and, and tell me that I'm wrong about this discrimination issue. And he said, okay, but you're wasting your money. And it's 500 bucks an hour I was wasting. And I said, well, spend three hours on it then. So he came back and he says, Lyle, you have a clear case of discrimination here. And we're, we got the city with their pants down and we're going to give it to them. And I said, oh, great. That sounds fantastic. And I said, how much is that going to cost? He says, well, you're going to have to put down at least a $50,000 retainer. Uh -huh. And I thought to myself, I thought, you know, San Francisco is not even a healing environment. You know, for, for what people are going through, it's too stimulating. I'm just going to take that money. I'm going to move. And so that's when we moved to Sedona. And the, the, the licensing process was another thing that was brought on us um, um, that we weren't, we weren't planning on doing the licensing thing um, because really, in our mind, what we were doing, we were using an outpatient doctor to monitor the meds. And, and we weren't doing treatment plans, and we weren't doing – formalized counseling. We were doing a lot around nutrition. And uh, one day the state rolled up and they said, uh, and they jumped out and they had four of them with badges and, you know, everybody's completely puckered up, scared. And fortunately, the one guy, he was like, he was like a George Carlin of, I mean, like, how do you, how do you end up working for the state being this completely charismatic? I mean, this is this really great guy, but he says, he says, okay, are you doing drug treatment? I said, no. You know, we're doing holistic um, treatment for people that, you know, have cravings and stuff to offset their cravings. So he asked me a whole litany of questions. He said, well, how are you doing this and how are you doing that? And he goes, what about their meds? 
where, where are you storing their meds? And I said, well, we keep them locked up in a closet, and then when it's time for them to administer meds, they, you know, they come and we open it up and they self-administer. And he goes, ah, that's not going to work. Because you need a license in order to be able to keep people's meds from them. If people hold their own medications, you can do it without a license. But if by virtue of the fact that you're going to hold and take possession of their medications, that opened up a whole licensing thing that, you know, we were, I mean, the, the, the rules and regulations for running a licensing and residential rehab are pretty impressive. It's 270 pages worth of code that is very condensed code. I mean, like, you must have fire sprinklers in every room, and that's one line. You must have a clinical psychologist who oversees blah, blah, blah. It's 200 and something pages of that stuff. And we had 45 days to put it together. And they said, you know, you're probably not going to do it. You might want to just shut down and do it. We did it. We got together. We pulled that thing apart. We wrote up policy and procedures and all of our employee files, hired the right people. We had to train the people in. You know, people had to sit for a certain number of um, clinical reviews and be supervised and all that stuff. We pulled all that stuff together, got our licensing, and and pulled it off. And so we've been licensed for the last six years, had no complaints against our license. Um, when they come to review us, we had no um, – we had a couple little um, – Things like, oh God, I can't even remember now. It was so minor. It was super minor. It wasn't. It was. It was like, yeah, something about having dogs at the center or something. You had had to have a, you know, had to have their rabies shots or something. <laughs> but you know, normally when the licensing board comes in, they you know they kind of tear you apart and find you and you didn't do this thing right and you didn't have all this signed and we we passed all that perfectly, and we're moving into a situation where we're going to have CARF. Uh, certification in the next three months and we've got a fellow helping us with that that used to be one of their surveyors so that should allow us to to elbow our way in network with places like Blue Shield and other insurance agencies that have historically been a little bit harder to um, to collect from once we're in network once we have contracts with them people will be able to come in here and use their full medical insurance not have to hopefully drop a dime on their copay and get this kind of treatment, get a real loving environment with real plants and real people that really actually care for them as opposed to what they've been traditionally getting. And I'm not going to have enough beds. And if, if I had every bed in Sedona, I wouldn't have enough beds. <laughs> well, I think that's true. You've, we've got about uh, five minutes left. Um, what what do you think is the most important first steps for people to take who want to look into setting up a, a place like your alternative to meds? Um, well, they're probably going to need about fifty thousand dollars at a minimum. They're going to have to. Um, they're going to have to get probably. I mean, if they want to do it on a small scale, they lease a place. Um, you're going to want a place that you can fit at least 10 people because you are going to need to pay your staff to be around there 24 hours a day. And to get in contact with the surveyor from their state um, that does the drug and alcohol and mental health licensing and get a copy of what it takes and just go through and highlight each one of those things that you don't already have and write up a policy for it or, you know, your building has to have sprinklers, you know, you have to have a certain kitchen, that kind of stuff. And just check out the list and get all that paperwork together first. Then go sit, you know, in on uh, a licensing, like, how to do. And then go ahead and, and actually put down your money for the lease for the place. You've got your paperwork. You hire your clinical director and you get in a relationship with your medical director. And once you have those two people, you can I – mean, I mean, one of the best things, if somebody wanted to start this, I, I like to give away this information. People could come and train at our center and learn how to do the more granular aspects of how to deliver this care because even though we make it look easy, it's not that easy. It took us a long time to figure this out. And just kind of maybe learn what we do, learn the things. We've made a lot of mistakes. We've learned a lot of things from our mistakes. Bypass having to make those mistakes yourself. Come out here, 
you know, if a, if a team wants to come out here and learn what we do, come out here and learn what we do, then you'll know what kind of staff to hire and how to train them. Um, <laughs> wow, there's so much to there's so much to think about here. I have a I have a friend, a couple of friends who are interested in doing something like this in New York State. I imagine that our regulations are much worse even than yours. I, my, our state's notorious for making it hard to get something started. Um, even our developing uh, Center for the Study of Empathic Therapy is a 501c3. The feds were easy, easy compared to New York State. But uh, I imagine, I'm sure the process is basically the same, though. Do you know anybody yeah, I mean, working I've heard, with I've heard the horror stories in New York. I've got a guy that was um, working with me for a little while that uh, was one of the uh, – was one he worked with the uh, whatever it's called up there, whatever the equivalent of the Department of Health Services. He was one of their um, surveyors. Um, I mean, I know there's certain nuances in New York that I'm not completely familiar with, but if a person really wants to do it, they're they're going to do it, you know. And they may feel like they're towing a train up up the hill um, in the beginning, but once that train starts to go downhill, they've got all that force and momentum behind them. There's people that want this so bad. There are so few people that have any idea about how to navigate people through this process that even each one of our graduates, I mean, it may miss them how valuable of information that they have. They've been right. through this. They've done it. Them getting out there and sharing it with people is is an uncommon knowledge. And that's how it was for me. I mean, it, there's nothing in my education or even if I'd had a got an education as a psychotherapist, that would have geared me up to being able to feel people on a real organic level as much as I can now because I've suffered like that. Lyle, we've got just a few seconds left, so I'm going to finish up and remind people who you are. We've been talking with Lyle Murphy. He's founder of Alternative to Med Center. It's in marvelous Sedona, Arizona, just going there will cure you of a great many things. He is doing something no one else in the world that I know of is doing. He's taking people with serious psychiatric kinds of issues who've been on meds for years, and he is in a residential setting taking them off. Lyle, I commend you on your courage and your determination. Thank you. Well, that's what's needed in this uh, in this fight is a lot of courage and a lot of determination. Thank you. Good luck right. with what you're doing. Keep on doing it's, it. It's been my honor, Doc. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> 